Welcome back to the Orchid City Zoo! Hey guys, Kingpin here. Welcome to the next episode of Sandbox Mode. The entrance of a zoo is arguably the most important part. It's what gives you your very first impression. This is why, off-camera, I did a little bit of work on our entrance. I added some more foliage and greenery to make it look more inviting. In case you missed the very last episode, we continued our trek into the Africa DLC with a very small habitat, but a very good one for our meerkats. So far we have four of them in this build. Let's go see what they're up to. Our four African meerkats enjoy spending their day playing with their enrichment items as well as burrowing around their enclosure. They've really begun to bond with each other. They're incredibly social and very well behaved. Their absolute favorite part of their enclosure is by far the termite mound, which is where they get their food. Overall, while not a flashy build, the meerkats are an incredible addition to the Africa section. Our meerkats are neighbors with the home of Rhino Research and Nourishment, or Horn for short. So far, Horn is home to a solitary southern white rhinoceros. This state-of-the-art facility is highly detailed both inside and out, and provides an excellent habitat for our lone southern white rhinoceros. I will admit, I am getting a little tired of just calling him the southern white rhinoceros. I officially welcome Brutus to the zoo. Thank you, GhostKid590, for the name suggestion. Feel free to leave name comments for any animal in the zoo. Brutus may be quite large, but so are our plans for today's episode. Matter of fact, we're starting a new Mega Build miniseries. Our first Mega Build at the Orchid City Zoo was quite successful. Using an Asian theme and template, Asia Quest takes up an impressive 4,500 square meter footprint in the Orchid City Zoo and is home to a variety of species of animals. Asia Quest is truly the build that put the Orchid City Zoo on the map in the eyes of the public. It's also just as detailed on the inside as it is the outside. To this day, I'm incredibly proud of Asia Quest, and despite it being my first mega build ever, I think it holds up incredibly well. Despite it holding up incredibly well, I think I can do a little better this time. There's not much I want to drastically improve on. Like I said, I'm still incredibly proud of the final product. The overall challenge of this next mega build is going to be keeping it in scale with what we've already made and a similar build style. I for one am up for the challenge, and I already have a really good idea and theme of exactly what we can make this new mega build. Let's talk about it. When making a mega build, the very first thing you should always do is reveal the name. This is because the name is inherently tied to how the build is going to play out. That being said, let us begin construction on Savannah at Dusk. As the name suggests, this is going to be an African-themed night hike. That means all of the animals in here are going to have indoor viewing and be nocturnal. This build is going to be dark. This is the rough outline, and as you can see, it's quite large, a little bit bigger than Asia Quest, matter of fact. It's going to be home to four exhibits. One here, one here, one here, and the last here. If you guys are enjoying today's video so far, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'd be happy to have you here in this wonderful community we're growing. Don't forget to stick around to the end of the video either. This build turns out a lot bigger than I thought. Progress on the Orchid City Zoo is coming along incredibly well, and matter of fact, with the upcoming tropical and arid packs quickly approaching, we're going to be able to add even more animals to the zoo. This is only 25% on the complexity meter. We have a lot of work. The first step that I personally like to do in creating a mega build, and this is the actual build portion, not the planning, is first place the path, and use two different colors, the interior color and the exterior color of the path. The black asphalt is eventually going to be covered up by the building itself. It's a night hike, I wanted to keep it dark, and the regular path is simply going to be the path leading up to the building, not covered. After you have your path down, simply use items to go on the grid and build around the path. If you have a rough idea of where you want your windows and viewing areas to be, leave them open for now. We're just trying to get a rough shape. If you feel you're a little bit more advanced, feel free to add the glass now. It's up to your personal preference, though. Don't overcomplicate things. Eventually, you're going to be left with a very basic outline like this, and this is exactly what we want at this stage. What I personally like to do next is look at the build from an aerial perspective, just like this. We already discussed where our four habitats are going to go, but from here, I'm going to pick one and kind of master this area before going on to the rest of the build. We're going to be starting on the right side right here with the aardvark today. By far, the best resource for any builder isn't anything you can place. It's the Zoopedia. An aardvark is going to need 330 square meters of space. This is relatively small. It says here that aardvarks are also solitary animals, meaning the space can be kept down. 
It doesn't look like their enrichment items take up much space either. This is gonna be a small habitat. It looks like they have cohabitation with meerkats as well. That doesn't really fit with the theme of Savannah at dusk though, so we'll pass on this. Thanks to the Zoopedia, we now know exactly what this habitat needs to be, and luckily it's not very big. Only 330 square meters, in a relatively easy and simple space. Aardvarks are very beginner friendly. Off camera, I went ahead and did two things. For one, I changed the rock to plaster, mainly to differentiate it from Asia Quest. And for two, I finalized where the habitats are officially gonna be. Building indoors can be tricky, so always remember to either leave yourself space for an outside section or a backstage to fulfill the animal's requirements. Before we actually start building for the aardvark, I want to add a little bit more detail to the facade of our building, and this basically means raising some sections and adding a roof in sections that are complete already. I purposely made this build very square and rectangular shaped in certain areas, so this task would be even easier. Effectively what we're trying to do now is mess around with the height of some portions of the build. We're gonna raise some portions like we're raising now, just simple one meter of the exact same plaster we've been using. Some sections like the middle are gonna be raised up to three meters. Later, we'll go back in with more complex shapes. Maybe we'll throw in some curves, maybe some slopes and ramps, who knows. But for now, we just want to get the basic outline of the building done. And this includes the height we want all of our areas to be, because we can't add the fine details until the basic ones are done. If you find yourself struggling with what we've done so far, I highly recommend you draw it out on a piece of paper. It actually seems simple, but it makes building buildings in this game ten times easier. This is also a personal thing, and it has nothing to do with the game, but I find it incredibly satisfying to have almost a written record of everything I've built so far, going all the way back to the start of the game. If you find yourself making zoos and dropping them relatively frequently, drawing them out and planning is a really good way to stop this from happening. I know it can be annoying, I'm guilty of this a few times on my channel, but ever since I started writing them down, I've had endless motivation. Looking good so far! Now that we have the shell of the building done, we can actually start to build for the aardvark. Before we bring him in, however, I want to finish the backstage area, so the aardvark has ample space and we don't have to redo it. I left two doors in the back for keeper access. This is where our backstage is going to be. One for the aardvark, and the other is going to be for the next episode in this exhibit to the right. When building a backstage section for a habitat, I like to focus on two things, looks and function. Looks is obvious, the habitat has to look good, and as does the backstage, but function can be a little bit more complicated. Let's talk about it. One of the largest flaws of our last mega build, Asia Quest, was the fact that there were no staff rooms, keeper huts, or anything of the sorts in the building. They were all relatively far away, so if there was an emergency, say our tiger escaped, which did happen more than once, one of our zoo guests could have been seriously injured or even killed before staff could have gotten there and properly handled the situation. This is because Asia Quest was all looks and very little function. It functioned very well as a habitat, but there were very little backstage areas present in Asia Quest. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Not every exhibit or habitat needs backstage presence, but the problem with Asia Quest is that it's relatively isolated in our zoo. It's quite far away from our nearest keeper huts. This is the exact same situation at the Savannah at Dusk Enclosure, so we're going to add a large keeper hut right to the back of it, so if there is an emergency, there's going to be keepers on site ready to act. Now that we know we're making a backstage area and we know exactly where it's going to be, we have to think about how to make it look good. This is going to sound kind of confusing, but the trick to making a backstage area look good is to kind of purposely make it look bad. Think about any job that you've ever worked. Odds are, the behind-the-scenes area where you go as an employee looks a little bit different than where the civilians would go. It's the same thing here. I'm quite a huge fan of how this turned out, actually. We have a nice staff path that leads directly back to our backstage area. We have a very large keeper hut, and even a section that we left open for our next episode. The animals are going to be able to come right out. This build is incredibly interesting to me, because it not only covers the base game, but also three of the console DLCs that have come out so far. You'll just have to wait and see. Welcome to the zoo! Feel free to leave name suggestions in the comments below for our male aardvark. 
The Aardvark's terrain requirements honestly surprised me a little bit. I figured they need a lot more sand than they actually did, since when I think of an Aardvark, albeit I don't know too much about this species, I picture them on the savanna near sand, since they like to burrow so much. Hitting this frontier curveball was a lot easier than I expected, and we hit it out of the park. In simple terms, all that we did was put grass and longer grass, which they do need a substantial amount of, surprisingly, very close to the guest viewing sections. We're going to be able to hide their enrichment items in this long grass to entice them to come over to the viewing sections, giving the guests an excellent view. After that, we dug down and gave them a bit of low ground. This is where we put a majority of the dirt and sand, which is where they're going to dig their burrows. We're going to be giving our armadillo the exact same termite feeder that we gave our meerkats. This is because armadillos are our first insectivore in the zoo. An insectivore is simply a branch of a carnivore or an omnivore. It means their primary diet is insects, just like a pescivore, or a pescatarian, is a primary diet of fish. Armadillos excel at eating termites right out of their termite mounds. Their claws are very effective at burrowing as well as breaking them open, and they have snouts very similar to anteaters, allowing them to eat termites. Our aardvarks are not going to appreciate all of this plaster. Believe it or not, it does not naturally occur in the African savanna. So therefore, we're going to use something that does to coat the walls. We're going to be using these desert and savanna rocks to make a really cool pattern along the wall and make it feel a lot more homey for the aardvark. Definitely still work to be done, but a great start! Unfortunately, while we were building, I failed to realize that these rocks that we're using actually have a fairly large hitbox, and now our aardvark doesn't have enough space to roam around. This is a very easy fix, however. Simply what we're going to have to do is give the aardvark a very small outdoor section. We can use this for the lore to say that maybe the zookeepers can come out here and research their outdoor behavior, because the rest of this is going to be completely hard shelter. Who knows? We have to be creative. This is actually going to be a really cool area because this is not public access. Alright, we're live. Don't usually do live commentary until the end of the video, but I figured this would be a really informative, almost mini-tutorial. Effectively what we're doing is using the mesh barrier, movement menu, and a very few other resources to make a perfect square. In really simple terms, choose your mesh barrier and put move snap on 2. This is going to get you to evenly space them every single time without fail. Afterwards, make sure you're rotating in increments of 90 degrees. The easiest way to do this is have your angle snap on 45 degrees and do it twice, since 45 times 2 is 90. This is going to get you very perfect and evenly spaced space. And it looks like our aardvark has just enough space and definitely has access to his outdoor plane. Remember, when you use traversable area, wherever there's blue, your animal can go. Isn't there something really satisfying about when all of your angles just flow together perfectly? Now that we're absolutely positive that our aardvark is going to have enough room to run around, it has enough traversable area as well, I say it's finally time to detail the interior. The only thing I'm not liking about this exhibit so far is how flat it is. While aardvarks do live in the savanna, which is typically a flat environment, I want a raised section close to one of our glass panes so the guests can have a really good view of them. This is going to be a little bit challenging, because if you recall, the Zoopedia said that aardvarks are not very good climbers. However, they are accustomed to rocky areas, so we're going to be using rocks to help them climb instead of traditional climbing equipment you might use for a primate. We're simply going to take a really flat savanna rock and rotate it right along the z-axis, making a very straight line. Since aardvarks are a little bit bigger than I thought they were in this game, surprisingly, we're going to need to give them a little bit of a bigger platform. We're simply just going to copy and paste, and then duplicate all of what we've built so far, and double it in size. Right now, all we have is a floating rock platform, and I don't think it looks very realistic, so we're simply going to take what we just duplicated, rotate it 90 degrees, and plug off the bottom. Now that we officially have our basic shape, we're going to have to do a little bit more details with the rocks to make sure that they blend in well. This can be a little bit difficult since rocks obviously are solid and not free-forming, so you're going to have to mess around with a variety of different shapes, sink them into the ground at different levels, but eventually you'll find something that looks natural. Remember, we want the aardvark to be able to climb up here, but not at every possible point. He has a set path, and that's on the right next to that big cladding rock. Let's just hope he can actually use it. Alright, moment of truth. This is always the scary part. And it looks like we did it correctly. Well, except for the termite hill. Just because you build a cool area for your animals to go and for your guests to view them from, doesn't necessarily mean they're actually going to use it, so you have to give the animals a reason to go up there. A very good way to do that is to put their habitat bedding up there, or any enrichment for that matter. 
They have a cardboard box already, but I'm thinking this slow feeder is going to make our aardvark go up there quite a lot. This is going to give the guests such a good view. Time for some foliage. Just like our big southern white rhinoceros Brutus and our four meerkats, aardvarks can tolerate plants, but they don't like a whole lot of them. Therefore, we're going to be using a lot of dry din grass in this exhibit. I really like using the dry din grass over the sand and soil because it adds a transition from the regular grass from the terrain menu. I wanted to find a good plant that would be a transition from the long grass to the rock wall and even the man-made sections right here, but I couldn't figure out a good one until I stumbled across the nettle. I think it works perfectly in this case. I wanted to have some plants in and around our rock section too, so I decided on this red oat grass since it looks a lot less vibrant than some of the other plants. I also wanted to add some more rocks down deep below. This almost looks like the aardvark tried to burrow here, but got stuck because this giant savanna rock was in its way. I decided to keep with the theme of elevation and the natural rocks and kick our little barrier out some more. I decided to keep rotating these big rocks about 180 degrees each way to give some interesting terrain modifications for the aardvark. It's going to let him have some high ground, some low ground, and a lot of areas to explore. We're going to have to move that termite mound eventually and blend these rocks into the surrounding environment, but I think it's going to look really nice. It looks less like an open field of grass now and more like an actual savanna with rocks and different elevations. We might as well move this out of the way now. I'm thinking we put it kind of in the center where the aardvark's ditch is. Yeah, I like right here a lot, actually. This will act almost like the centerpiece of the exhibit. This looks awesome, but remember, this is a nocturnal house. We're gonna have to detail it up and put the roof back on. Detailing the interior of builds can be a little bit overwhelming at first, but there are ways to make it easier. The number one thing I can say when detailing anything is start small. Take it section by section at a time, and don't try to do anything too grand if you're not ready for it. I also typically like to start with these functional details, such as habitat webcams and education boards. If you're not quite sure what I mean by this, in summary, anything under the facilities menu, not construction, is functional. These include things like do not disturb signs, benches, donation bins, trash and recycling, pretty much anything guests can use. After the functional details are in place and the guests can officially use the facilities, I then like to work on the theming, and theming can be a little bit tricky. But for example, in this room, if you'll look through that glass and remember what we did on the back side of it, this is where our aardvark platform is, so we're going to detail the back of this to look a little bit like a cave, maybe a burrow that the aardvark dug out that we happen to be walking through. Obviously, it's not realistic. The aardvark would have to be about the size of a grizzly bear to dig this burrow. No matter how realistic or not, theming your builds just gives them a lot more character. Now we need to work on the outside a little bit, since it is just a big plaster facade. The first thing I always like to do is add the doors, and my one big gripe of doors is how they're not double-sided. They look terrible from behind, so what I like to do is place it exactly where I want to, and then just place another one 180 degrees right behind it. Some doors don't necessarily fill up the holes in the grid items, therefore we can come in with a little door trim, and all this is is different items from the construction menu that you build around the door. This adds a little bit more depth, and we're actually going to use this door trim to help decorate the rest of the build and make it look better. To do this, we're simply going to duplicate the top section of the door frame, and then move it all along the front of the building, breaking up the gray of the plaster with the brown of the wood, and making the build look better. If you ever get stuck or frustrated detailing a specific part, simply take a break and go back to the interior. It's really nice. You'll see it later in the video, but I actually quite like the effect that the wood gave on the plaster, so we're going to do something very similar to the interior of this build. We're just going to take the exact same door frame we've been using, and then copy and paste it up on the top of the wall to break up the color. A general rule of thumb as well, the more labels, the better. If you guys liked the way we detailed this build while specifically talking about exactly what we were doing and less of an unbroken time lapse, let me know in the comments below. I'm really trying to level up my content and take this channel to the very next level soon. 
I appreciate your patience since uploads have slowed down this month. However, this month was extremely successful and the videos are having a lot more effort put into them, so there always is a bright side. For being episode 1 out of 4 for the Savannah at Dusk enclosure, I think we got well over 25% of the build done. Let's do a live walkthrough to end the video. I'm incredibly proud of how the exhibit's turning out so far. I especially like the sign. I almost made the dusk part look like it was falling off. I really like it. Coming inside, you can obviously see it's a little bit dark in here. It's still daytime and there's holes everywhere, so it's not quite pitch black yet, but for a night hike it's dark enough already. I had a lot of fun recording this episode, I learned a lot about aardvarks. And look, he even jumped up here for once, this is the first time I've ever seen him up here. I'm incredibly proud of how this little aardvark room turned out. It has signs everywhere, highly detailed, and there doesn't look like an inch of it that went untouched, which is exactly my goal when I go out to build an exhibit like this. I want everywhere to have high effort. The Orchid City Zoo really couldn't have asked for a better possible start to the new mini-series. We really came through, and I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. There's more to come really soon. In the next episode, we have to complete the backstage and add the second exhibit to Savannah at dusk, and there's going to be a lot more than one animal in here, I can promise you that. Until then, Kingpin out. See you guys next time!